Boy, what a powerful place to be. Can I get everybody to be quiet, right? All right, can everybody hear me okay? If you haven't found a seat yet, just you know, make a, make your way there. Oh, here we go, here we go, here we go. Okay, housekeeping stuff. If you haven't located a restroom yet, it's out that door to the right. If your cell phone, if the ringer is on, just go ahead and click it off. If you're too old to know how to click it off, I have a granddaughter over here that can show you. <laughs> all right here we go all right so we're gathered today to celebrate the life of our uh dear departed brother tim anyway my name is bud corn for those of you that don't know me and i'm a fellow recovering addict and a good friend of our departed brother first off i'd like to uh um thank tim's family for allowing me the honor of leading this celebration of life Anybody that knows Tim, you know, we're here to celebrate Tim today, but I've known Tim for a long time. And uh, since he first came into recovery, we have had 12,496 days of celebrating Tim. Of course, those of you that are, you know, his kids may be a little longer than that, but I mean, those of you that are in the recovery field, that's, you know, that's, anyway, that's where we're at. So anyway, Tim was born October 8th of 1950 in Los Angeles, California. He turned out pretty good for being from Los Angeles, I think. And uh, passed away December 11th, 2024, at the Minton, California home that he loved and shared with Kathy. Um, so I'm chewing nicotine gum, okay? I'm not doing this to be rude, but I don't want to like fall apart up here completely. So anyway, so uh, bear with me. Uh, he now sits at the celestial meeting in the heavens with all those who passed before him. So I first met Tim sometime in October of uh, 1990 as I approached my first NA meeting after getting released from treatment. So there sat this somewhat young Tim, though he was 40 at the time, somewhat young, uh, with his long hair, and you remember Tim with long hair, uh, on the steps of the church at the corner of uh, Redlands Boulevard and State Street. Uh, I remember his welcoming smile and warm reception, and he made me like he did so many others over his 34 years clean. Feel like I had found a home in Narcotics Anonymous. Now, this isn't officially a Narcotics Anonymous meeting, but there's going to be a little bit of talk about that, I'm sure, throughout the day. So, Tim will be remembered by many friends and acquaintances uh, who shared in this loss. However, none will bear the loss as much as his family. Of course, Tim was like family to all of us, right? So, personally speaking, uh, Tim and Kathy served as uh, godparents to our granddaughter, Emily. They took her to events and were always there for all of us. But anyway, I, I put this in here. Our dogs were equally family. I remember when Harley and our little girl, girl Georgie, had their first romantic experience. So as they were I locked in the throes of fornication, but those of you that don't know what that means, they... Uh, we're doing the deed and they couldn't get them apart. And Tim and I were trying to figure it out. We're laughing and we're dipping them in the pool and we're gently tugging at them. And, you know, it was so, um, you know, we just laughed and laughed as, you know, and nothing was successful but time. And uh, another, another great memory is uh, Tim taught our, uh, taught our grandkids to surf in his pool. So they did some uh, doughboy surfing, right? You know, making a wave and getting up on there. And and he must have done a good job because on a recent trip to Kauai, all the kids successfully hit the waves. So anyway, at this time, there's going to be more from me later on. But anyway, at this time, we're going to hear some from friends and family who will share their memories of Tim. Let's see how this works. <laughs> and how their lives were impacted by this special soul. Do you see my fingers going up? Yeah. Song one. 
So, uh, and share some of their memories. Hi everyone, it's so good to see everyone here today. Um, my name is Mindy. I am Tim's stepdaughter, um, or my his uh, longtime partner Kathy's daughter. And um, I'm just I'm so glad to be here today. But I'm I also am like I thought I'd cried. Oh, I was gonna cry, and I can't believe that. Um, I saw Kathleen has gone, to be honest. It's been a month, and um, I miss him so much. He he and I shared a really special bond, but there was also just this really important peace of mind that knowing that my mom, um, she, you know, she lived this really fun, amazing life. And when they met, knowing that she was so happy and had found the true love of her life is something that... Um, it's just indescribable. And so um, I just, yeah, we really miss him. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about our bond. We shared sobriety together and I celebrated 18 years last year and he, um, not the deal. <laughs> I, I, yeah, thanks. Um, but yeah, and he I had 34 and he would call me every year just to tell me how proud he was of me. And um, he truly, he truly filled that, that stepfather role for me. I called him Poppy and um, I, uh, and I have dogs and, you know, I would always say that they were his grand dogs and, um, but we shared a lot of things. One thing was a little bit of vanity. Um, he loved to look good, and I and I do too. I'm very vain, and I I always laughed that for such like kind of a you know Harley riding dude, he went to the tan booth, and I was like, oh, I like to look good, you know. So I thought that was a very cute um, trait. And then I also found out this is kind of interesting. I found out that he had no tattoos. And so for like a motorcycle riding dude, you'd think he'd have like a bunch of tattoos and he didn't. So I thought that was like always kind of, I'm like, Oh, that's funny. I have more tattoos than you do. Um, but yeah, I just, I, you know, he, he was truly, truly one of a kind. And, um, and yeah, I just, I, I always marvel at the dichotomous nature of him. He's very, you know, rough and loved his tools and everything, but also very emotional. And I remember one time we were talking and he out of nowhere cheered up and he was like, wow, I'm going to walk you down the aisle. And um, unfortunately, my commitment issues prevented that. But um, I know that, I know that you'll be there in spirit when I do um, one thing to get married. I can't believe you won't be there. Um but I just wanted to say that I'm so glad to be here today celebrating him. And I can just see that he would be so happy that everything showed up for him. And he would be, you know, a, a walking around just enjoying the fact that everyone's here to celebrate him. And it's so amazing. So I wanted to do something kind of funny. And I, you know, just humor me here. But I thought we'd get it all started with a little bit of cheer. And I would love if we could all just say, Timmy, 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 Timmy. So, I guess, um, thank you all so much for coming. And then also, shout out to my mom because it's been a month and it's been really, really hard um, to, to, to go through every day, but she worked so hard on this today. And I think that he would be so proud of you. So, thanks. Thank you, Mindy. That was beautiful, incredible. Um, my name is Matt. I am Mindy's brother, Kathy's son, and Tim's stepson. Um, it is truly remarkable to see so many people here, but it's not surprising in the least um, to celebrate Tim's life. And 
I love that the terminology celebration of life because that's really how he lived him and my mom you know and they walked the walk you know they lived their life to the fullest they celebrated every day and anytime you got to spend with them you felt that and you knew that and that's why there's so many people here right now Tim came into our lives 10 years ago and changed him forever when him and my mom started dating. Admittedly, I may not have given him the warmest welcome when I first heard him and my mom had been having weekly movie nights for a few months that we didn't know about. <laughs> but once I saw how much they enjoyed each other's company and really lit each other up, I had no choice but to surrender to his charm and kindness. <laughs> but most importantly, for the love he had for my mom. With all my mom had accomplished in her life, my only hope for her was to find somebody to share with and to experience love with. Tim not only fulfilled this hope, but exceeded our, our expectations in every way. As Tim and my mom became a full-time and inseparable item, his and my relationship inevitably grew stronger as well. And I ultimately got to have him as a stepdad who supported me in all facets of my life. And for that, I will forever be grateful. I loved hearing about all the incredible work he did supporting those in recovery or with the drug courts, as my work in the mental health field and suicide prevention covered a lot of similar ground. One of the things I will always be most appreciative to Tim for is when him and my mom would get up early on a Sunday morning in March and ride his Harley all the way to LA to meet me at mile 18 to support me in running the LA Marathon. That's a big commitment. <laughs> Waking up early, doing the LA traffic on Marathon Day, getting fuel and water, wanting to see me for a few minutes. No matter how tough of a time I'd inevitably be having at mile 18, I always knew mom and Tim would be there and would give me the boost of energy I needed. And they were always there without, that, without a fail. This last year in March, I by far was having my toughest race I've ever run and I missed seeing them at mile 18. Luckily, the course changed and doubled back around at mile 24. I was in really rough shape by the time I hit 24 and was using every last ounce of energy to keep myself moving forward and didn't think I'd be able to see them at all and kind of was not even able to even think about it. I was hopeful, but thought I had missed them since we had always seen them earlier at 18. But lo and behold, I look up, see mom and Tim, Mile 24, it's a perfect time. I ran up, gave them an ecstatic, huge hug, and I'm pre pretty sure we all started crying tears of joy. After a few minutes of chatting, rest, fueling, more hugs and laughs, and the famous Tim selfies, they sent me on my way. It was such a special moment and a much needed boost of love and energy that really felt special and different this time. Even the people around us saw, felt, and acknowledged it. Although this was the last time, right? Although that was the last time he would be with us on the course in person, I know he will be with me this March when I run my tooth. That's not in his honor. Thank you for everything, Tim. I love you. Hi, my name is Jacob. Um, Matt and Mindy are my cousins, but in all purposes, brother and sister. Um, and Kathy has always been one of my most loved family members. Um, she's always been there for me. And I remember when Tim showed up one day, and you know, he immediately started telling me to do this or do that. <laughs> um, and he would come over and help me out. Uh, when I, I would stay at Kathy's house, I was renting from her, and I'd chop down a ton of trees. And she wanted them gone. So he showed up the next day with the trailer, and we filled that trailer up. And it was kind of scary driving in the car with him. <laughs> um, but he always had a tool. If I didn't have something to, to do, one of the many jobs I was trying to do, he always had a tool I could use. And he had maybe seven or eight of them. Mm -hmm. um, he would tell them in the back shed or in the garage. You, you're going to find one of them somewhere. Um, 
I, I was really fortunate to find someone and I know how beautiful it is. And when my aunt found him, I was so happy. And we had Tim officiate at our wedding because Tim has incredible energy. <laughs> um, he asked me what he should say and I said, just say what you want to say because <laughs> I'm not really good. See, I'm not reading these <laughs> Um and he did a wonderful job. And I remember the last time he called, um, we moved to North Carolina and he called and wanted to let me know that, and Kathy was in a surgery. And I just, I remember before he left how tired he was and he had so much energy on the phone. And then when I got told that he'd passed away, um, My my wife comes walking into the room and she you, know, you see her me with tears in my eyes and she she's like what's wrong? I told her it's it was wonderful to see him with my son. I never have a great memory of being with like my grandparents, and so seeing him with my son just was beautiful, and I'm gonna miss him. So you're saying about Tim having tools around his house, and if you ever visited Tim, he had like three table saws, four cutoff saws, nine chain saws. I mean, just anything you could imagine around there. So. Uh, it was kind of funny. So, um, so the next uh, family member sharing their memories of Tim will be Nick. Those to the ones that we lost in the last presentation spring back on the memories and the memories. All right. I'm Nick Gilmore and Tim was my stepdad. I'm sharing from my family. My mom, Stacy, my brother, Mike, Tim's grandkids, Michael, Violet, Matthew, and Dean, and his daughters in law, Kirsten and Jim. Mm. Tim and in our family when I was eight or nine years old. And one of my first memories was Red Ribbon Parade, in which we rode him, rode him his motorcycle. Uh, it broke down in the middle of the parade and we had to, we had to push it out. Uh, Tim had 34 years clean in Narcotics Anonymous and helped thousands of people get and stay clean from drugs and alcohol. Tim and my mom both worked at Cedar House. That's where they met. Tim used that experience to climb the ladder in drug courts and my mom in residential treatment. He loved doing groups with clients and started giving out candy to keep people interested. Later, that shifted to money somehow. He was always giving something away. My mom says that they learned to use computers and cell phones together. It was a fun time for them. Tim loved numbers. And when Excel came out, I thought he would never leave the computer. He learned about that program and started making spreadsheets for everyone. Tim could tell you the part number from every Honda motorcycle up to about 1990. He knew every part on the bike. He knew all the numbers. He was all about Hondas until my mom came along and said, no, Harley Davidson. <laughs> At the time, he had a sportster, but decided to upgrade. He said, Goldwing. She said, Road King. He came home with a Dino White Glide. For my first job, he paid me to mow the grass at his house on Sierra Way. When Tim was teaching me how to drive stick shift, I ended up hitting the curb a little bit. 
we both started laughing. My first car was tenfold tempo and it had the automatic seatbelts. I, I, I hated those seatbelts. Tim have tools and tinker in the garage. We have that in common. Anytime I didn't have a tool I needed, I could call Tim or vice versa. He helped me get my number from Anthony, one of his best friends, and I still have that car. Tim could make friends anywhere. It didn't matter where he was or what he was doing. Tim made a friend. Some he truly loved were Norm, Sam, Anthony, Tracy, and Bud. He loved them like brothers and talked about them all the time. Tim had thousands of friends and loved them all. Tim told my brother and I a lot of stories, mostly about his brothers and dad. Like when Steve landed a helicopter in the field next to Danny's house, scaring the hell out of everyone in the neighborhood. He told us about his dad building an airplane and flying around Redlands. He talked about Danny and his time at UPS. Danny helped my brother Mike get a job at UPS, and he's still there 25 years later. He loved to talk about Shauna and Scotty and how much they meant to him. He would share stories about Scotty's girls and their visits, wishing they lived closer. He loved his grandkids more than life itself. Tim was an amazing grandpa. Every visit came with $2 bills and silver dollars. He and Kathy were always there to babysit at a moment's notice. He would pick them up from school, have overnight visits, coach T-ball, play Wii with them, teach them to swim, take them in the garage to twinker, tinker, and just be involved. He took little Michael for an airplane ride, and at two years old, let Violet build her own toolbox, complete with pieces of wire, screws, and pliers. They would walk to A&W for ice cream and root beer floats almost every visit. The kids love him and Kathy very much. When my brother came home from the army, we all went to the pool hall. Mike and I thought we'd show Tim how to play pool. He kicked our asses over and over. We went on trips to the shooting range often. Me, Mike, and little Michael at our favorite spots. Tim and I would carpool together. That way we could leave just a little bit early and not have to clean up targets. My dad and Tim loved to camp at the beach. We camp at Carlsbad and put the boat in Oceanside Harbor. We all loved being on the water, and Tim loved being captain of the boat. One time, we took our dog, Lucy. She climbed onto the bow and took a shit. The wind caught it, and we had to dodge church. It's pretty hilarious. I'll never forget that. My mom wants me to tell you that she loved him very much and truly enjoyed the fun times they had together. Camping, boating, horseback riding, NA meetings, conventions, the time in the Treasures Motorcycle Club. She loved sitting side by side in the office, shooting ideas about work back and forth and easy Sunday mornings, having coffee and reading the paper. She would miss Tim very much. Our lives are forever changed by Tim. He was a trustworthy and honorable man with compassion and wisdom. We love you, Tim. All right, so we're going to move momentarily to the realm of uh, friends that Tim impacted over the years. Through his work, Tim was able to expand his love uh, for the recovery community. I remember going to many drug court graduations and seeing Tim beam with pride at uh, this, excuse me, at the successes of these programs. Tim and I had a special link in this regard as well. He needed to expand some office space in my affiliation with Southern California Edison. I brought in some equipment, manpower, and uh, 
helped him get the job done. And he kept sharing about that over the years. Um, maybe only when I was sitting in the meeting, I don't know. But anyway, so uh, at this time, you catch that? Back. There we go. Debbie Stevenson is in the Hello. My name is Debbie Seema, and uh, this is my TED Talk about Tim. In the TED Talk, you get about an hour to talk exclusively about something that you know a lot about and that you're passionate about. And I went, this is my time. Only they told me I had five minutes, so now it's a Tim Talk. It's got to be very quick. I worked with Tim for 30 years. I knew him, uh, well, we read about the time, 1994, when he worked with Stacy at Cedar House. I'd just come to the county to work for the uh, alcohol and drug programs. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on, you know, back then at Cedar House, except I was in charge of residential facilities to evaluate them or something for the county. Anyway, fast forward a couple of years, excuse me. He's working for mental health systems, I think running the PRIDE program. And uh, he tells me about this job at the court. And he said, it's something called drug court. And I think they're looking for a coordinator. And he said, I want you to talk to, you know, Judge Morris, Pat Morris. He said, now three people have turned this job down. So I'm not so sure you're going to want it, but it's a great program. He believed in it. So I met Judge Morris and I got the job. <laughs> And I give all of that to Tim. It was the best job in my life. We did this together for over 30 years, well, 25 years anyway. He retired. And it was a beautiful marriage. Um, my job as the coordinator was to try to get everybody very nice together um, to get people not only into recovery, but through recovery. And so the job was to get the judges and attorneys treatment and probation to all play nice together. Well, thank God Tim was over the treatment programs because we got along so well, he was able to draw people in. He was able to develop relationships. I, I called Tim my work husband. He called me his work wife. In fact, I the last time, not the last time I saw him, but I saw him when he was in the hospital and he was not doing well and barely coherent, barely had his eyes open. And anyway, I was starting to leave and I think it was Stacy or somebody else walked in the room and I said, well, Tim, I'm going to go. And he grabbed my hand and he went, my work wife. <laughs> He's so sweet. <laughs> Anyway, I found a, actually a quote about what that means to be a work spouse, and it fit us perfect. It says, a work spouse relationship is defined as a special platonic friendship with a work colleague characterized by a close emotional bond, high levels of disclosure and support, and a mutual trust, honesty, loyalty, and respect. That was us. We have the benefit of being friends without being friends with benefits. So we avoided a lot of complications. We have none. We have none. We, he made me laugh all the time. And honestly, uh, we never had a you know, sore word with one another, ever. Uh, it was just a perfect marriage. So Tim and I had uh, the privilege of traveling together for oh, a good 15 years of our uh, work history. 
Um, we were writing these grants with a grant writer called Hattie Byland. She was fabulous. And we were, they were almost giving away grants. It's not like we were great grant writers, but through Hattie's expertise and my being able to fill in, and Tim always doing the budget, and it's always the budget that gets your grant passed. <laughs> Um, we always got these grants. And so when you got a grant to start a new program, you had to take a team to travel, uh, to training, sorry. And we'd have to go for three days and it was like three weeks, you know, uh, through a period of six months or something. So we did a lot of traveling together. Plus both he and I worked for uh, National Joe Code Institute. We were facilitators, trainers. We were on the road a lot. It's a lot of time together. <laughs> And he would, uh, sometimes we would go to these trainings and Tim, you know, I don't know if you know his eating habits, but no weird. So he never went to dinner with anyone. He always went to an AA or any meeting and he brought me along to a few of them. These are all over the country. And I remember them always being in dark day church basements. That's why I remember at the meetings. Every now and then we'd go to one that was above ground. <laughs> But usually they release the below. But I learned a lot from Tim in those meetings and the 12 steps and the 12 commitments and the reading of working the steps and fellowship and gratitude. And Tim was the essence of gratitude when I met him and sustained throughout my entire 30 year history. Tim had a voice early on in the drug court years, mostly because of Judge Morris, Pat Morris, and he was the president of the National Association. So Tim got to work, and even before I was involved, with some big chiefs up in D.C., and the Bureau of Assistance was giving out these grants, and they had a director, and she and Tim were tight, and he was able to help when they developed the um, 10 key components of the foundation of drug courts. He was in the room when those were developed. He had a voice about treatment and he had a voice about AA and NA. Um, Tim was at the very first drug court convention. So drug court started in 1989, but this was in about 19, I'd say 93 or 94 when we had the first convention. I think it was in LA. And there were about a hundred people there. Now, those conventions host about 7,000 people, and they're the largest criminal justice uh, convention in the United States. So Tim was well known in the world of the uh, drug court. Uh, he, pr he provided training at not just the big annual you know, NADCP conventions, but also the state conventions, county and local trainings. He was always there. Um, so he was the first program manager that I knew from mental health systems, eight programs in Riverside. In fact, I looked at his, uh, the quilt over here, and it means every facility that he was in charge of developed. I mean, I knew what we had in San Bernardino, and of course I knew he had them, um, Santa Maria, Santa Rosa, Fresno, you know, all of the state. He was, he was amazing. Um, let me see, let me get back on track here, get off track. <laughs> um, so anyway, that was a lot of time on the road together. We went to every graduation together and we never missed a graduation. Every missed a graduation, we had programs, San Bernardino County anyway, we had programs in Needles, Barstow, Joshua Tree, Victorville, Big Bear, you know, and then the other ones close to town. So. I just want to say this about his eating habits because, you know, we would go to these trainings and they always started right after five o'clock, usually right after court. And uh, so we'd get on the road, 3.30, you know, four, maybe. And I'd go, hey, let's get some to eat. He goes, oh, I have dinner in the back. You know, just, just look around in the back and you'll find, I have bananas, I have a hot dog, I got these little beautiful sausages, you know. Not once did we stop for dinner. Not once. One time, coming back from Barstow, I don't know Barstow, Joshua Tree, something, I said, please, and he let us go through a drive-in so I could get something to eat. He, just, he didn't eat. 
he didn't eat, he didn't care about food, and um, he told me to take care of myself. <laughs> In 2006, we had a huge drug court convention in Seattle, Washington, with over 5,000 in attendance. And Tim was awarded in front of everybody the highest award provided by the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, the Stanley. Called the Stanley Goldstein Hall of Fame Award. Uh, Judge Goldstein started this back with Janet Reno back in 1989 in Florida. And so uh, that was a big name. And the only people that got awarded with this were usually judges and people at a high ranking level at the federal level that were making significant changes. But the way it works is your name, get, you get nominated by somebody. Anybody can be nominated as long as you drug court professional, and then they put out the news to the 5,000 strong membership that they have, and they select one person. And in 2006, R. Tim Smith won that award. He's a Hall of Famer. Uh, there are a couple things about Tim that um, probably many of you enjoyed, just like I did. But one of them was swearing. I think somebody else brought it up. Now, I don't know what it was about me and Tim being in the car. We were in the car a lot, but whenever somebody cut him off, or he, we would start swearing like sailors for till we were blue in the face, laughing, couldn't go on anymore. And I cannot read any of it. It was vulgar, it was awful, but we laughed so hard. And then we'd just go right back to driving again and, you know, talk about things, and then somebody would come in, and I'm and I don't want to, and we were like, you don't want that person, pull over, pull over. It was bad. It was bad. We, we had a lot of fun. <laughs> um, anyway, one time we went to a convention, uh, and we were walking up. We were the delegation from California, is Pat Morris. Um, and me and Tim, sometimes Hattie was with us. But anyway, we walked up to a rather large group of people. I don't know which convention this was, out of state. And uh, how are you guys doing? And somebody, who wasn't a usual, went, are you two a couple? And of course, we both looked at each other and started laughing, you know. And I said, no, we're not a couple. I said, Tim is like my brother. Okay, Tim goes like this. Your brother, your brother, ouch, Seema, you didn't have to say it that way. So, he never had an inside voice. He was always loud. Another funny story. We were in an elevator. I had, Matt just won the LA, won, won, won the LA Marathon. And we go into this elevator. I'm not expecting this. All of a sudden, Tim goes, hey, Seema, did you do anything fun this weekend? I'm looking at Tim. Tim, he goes, yeah, did you win a medal? Did you do something? Did you go somewhere? So finally, you know, I said, oh, okay. We've got 15 people in the elevator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ran the marathon. He did it at every single elevator we got into that convention. Everybody knew I went to that marathon, that convention. It was very funny. He was really good at building relationships. So we had a difficult time getting the Fontana Drug Court DA on board one time. We had a big power. We had the sheriff there. The money was there. Of course, the judge, the um, um, supervising judge at the time, the DA and you know, others. And we weren't on the end the DA was just thinking, you know, don't give these people a chance. And um even the judge was like, you know, we got to come around, we got to see this. Anyway, the judge, um, Tim, looks over at the sheriff and he says, what kind of gun you got there? And of course, the sheriff tells him, and Tim says, yeah, I got one like that. You know, and we start talking about guns. The DA gets in on it. Next thing you know, they have a date at the shooting range, all three of them, the sheriff, Tim, and the DA, and Fontana flourished. I, I don't know what to say. Uh, another thing about Tim, I never heard him say a negative word about anybody. 
And he just didn't be bad mouth anybody. Well, a couple of the judges maybe went. But mostly for everybody, for all the employees he had, you know, for all of the people that we worked with, he really never said anything negative. I just love that about him. Now, when I would start to say something negative and I'd start to talk to somebody else, gossip, they'd walk up and go, oh, so you're uh, pulling somebody else's inventory, are you? Okay, I'll shut me up. <laughs> um, I'm lost in my in my wheelchair. I practiced. Oh yeah, I wanted to say something about this because he used to laugh at me because um, I was training all the time for some for something, and I either running or playing racquetball or something, and uh, he didn't. He scoffed at me. What are you doing all that for? Until he met Kathy. And then next thing you know, we stayed in touch after he retired. I was still working, but and he calls and um, says, uh, "Yeah, we're going to this kickboxing class. Kickboxing, kickboxing. You never did anything for the whole twenty-five years I know you. Kickboxing, running half marathons, now pickleball, his very favorite. It was unbelievable the changes that he made. You know." After Kathy, and you know, he just he just kind of came alive. Somebody did mention that he was a numbers guy, um, and I like I said, every grant we wrote, he did all the numbers on it. It was always perfect. He kept a spreadsheet on everything. He was uh, the California Association of Collaborative Court Treasurer volunteer job for about fifteen years. He was our treasurer until he retired a couple years ago. I wanted to read something because Diane Marshall, who we worked with, they didn't get along great, but um, she was the secretary. They wanted heads. They were so much alike. She said, if ever there was a guy with special sauce, it was Tim Smith. If ever there was a person meant to move, breathe, and implement collaborative justice therapeutics, therapeutic jurisprudence, it was Tim. Tim's earthiness, his capacity to listen and cut to the chase are invaluable, especially when working with professionals who like to call a 5,000-page document a brief. <laughs> so I'm glad to have known Tim and been able to work with him through the Collaborative Association um, for 27 years. I want to say that because of the numbers thing. He did have a spreadsheet on everything, you know. And sometimes when I'd say, I'm not sure what I'm, you know, where I'm supposed to be or where can I am, go, you have a spreadsheet on that? They train me though <laughs> on spreadsheets. Uh, anyway, we had many awards from MHS, Riverside County, San Bernardino County. Um, but he really took pride in two things, as far as I'm concerned things that he could build with his tools, with his hands, and the lives that he touched through AA and NA it meant everything to him. He was not a religious person but he sure believed in a power greater than himself. Tim made me a better person. He walked the talk. He was a gentleman. He was trustworthy. He was a confidant. He was humble and forgiving and generous. And he was my friend. Thank you. I did, I did bring, by the way, because I used to give these away all the time, the silver dollars. And whenever I came over, my grandkids were around anything. And these $2 bills, sometimes in little cases. I had a stack of $2 bills that he was, you know, would give out to people and friends. I kept them. Very generous. Sorry, just wanted to throw that to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We need that one, too. All right. Uh, all right. So, um, number four. So, uh, Tim made many friends over uh, more than 34 years of working. With his fellow recovering addicts, and uh, at this time, uh, I'm going to invite up one of those people 
Tim spent on it. Uh, I'm grateful to be here today, uh, clean and sober, and I'm grateful for all of you to be here. Uh, I could go on and on about Tim Smith. I could speak all day about my buddy Tim Smith, my friend Tim Smith. I don't, do I really need a mic? I guess I do. Okay. So anyway, I could really spend all day talking about Tim Smith. Some of these people here have ruined my thunder. They've taken my 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 jokes or my thing, uh, what I was going to say. But, you know, my first thought was, how many people could actually bring, and I don't want this to sound wrong, but three past relationships into the same room? And who we got? We got, we got you know, anyway, I'll let, I'll let that one go. I mean, you got a work life. I mean, what more can you ask for? Uh, so I want to do a couple things that are going to be hands-on, uh, kind of get involved, but I, I would like to see a show of hands of how many people were touched by Tim Smith. It's flipping amazing. And I can say just about anything. If you're going to say fornication, I can say just anything I want to say, I guess. But are we getting, are we getting recorded here? Uh oh. All right. So uh, another thing I want to say is that there are, and I'm going to get this wrong, but there's got to be at least a half a dozen, maybe even more different types of groups out there. Who went camping with Tim Smith? Okay, who went surfing with Tim Smith? Who rode a Harley with Tim Smith? Who went to school with Tim Smith? Who had their life altered or changed by Tim Smith? Who played pickleball with Tim Smith? <laughs> Okay. That's the thing. I'll tell you what, every, I really wish I could play. I can't do a left or right because of my knee. I, I need surgery. I'll tell you what's that? Travel. Tra what? Travel. Who travels? Oh, travel, travel. Okay, oh, sorry. I, well, I'm not done. I said, Greg, dear. You guys are, I'll keep me on track. Who traveled with, with Tim Smith? All right. Okay. So who was a uh, treasure with Tim Smith? Are there any treasures here? Do you have any treasures? Okay. Uh, we have a few. All right. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of things. And I, I think you overestimated the number of chainsaws. I think it's seven, uh, maybe more, depending on the day. Uh, I met Tim Smith when I was a lot thinner, had a lot of hair, or a lot more hair. Uh, I walked through the rooms of Cedar House in uh, July 27, 1993. And all of a sudden, this guy comes out. He's in a suspenders. He's got he's got a white shirt on. He's got long hair. He's got a mustache, and he is excited. He's happy. He's all of that that I just didn't want to be a part of. I had just uh, come off a binger. Uh, I walked through the doors, and I was there for sixty days. Uh, Tim Smith changed my life. He was the first person I met. Uh, a couple of years later, uh, after, you know, I guess apparently there's some kind of rule you can't have any kind of relations with uh, people from uh, recovery, you see, after rape, I asked him to be my sponsor. So it's Tim's been my sponsor, oh, I don't know, 27 years. Uh, and uh, I miss my friend. Yeah, I miss my friend. So what I learned from Tim Smith is a lot of things, but two things that really stand out for me is uh, the first one is uh, page 91 or 95, depending on the basic text you're looking at, is uh, uh, is, is the quote about, oh, geez, I'm going to lose my name right now. Um, they, uh, lack of daily maintenance shows up in many ways. So when they talk about daily maintenance, it's it's God it's God centered, uh, meditation centered, uh, being the best person you, you can, being patient. Over the years, uh, I noticed that Tim was a, uh, he was more patient with drivers. I, I was really surprised because originally, you know, it was the kid. What Debbie Seema said was cussing and yelling and screaming at 
everybody that would you know drive the wrong way or cut them off or whatever. But over the years, he got better with that. Uh, he was, uh, and we called him Turbo. He's got lots of nicknames. Uh, Tim, I mean, literally one time we were playing golf, and I think Luis was with us, uh, and I, we're uh, Scott's in here somewhere. Uh, we were playing golf, and I had this bum leg, right? Tim's always like going, going, going. And I'm trying to get into the car, and he's driving away. And I'm like, Tim, dude, dude, well, you, just, you got to be quicker. I, Tim, I can't walk. I can barely play. I, you know, I can barely walk. But he's like ready to go. And he did this like three or four times while we were trying to play golf. So there's a lot of things that I did with Tim Smith. Uh, I learned to like his dogs. I, I'm not really an animal person. But now I've got uh, two uh, kids, uh, uh, Harley and Heidi, and, you know, and uh, uh, I've got a new family, uh, Scotty and, and uh, Shauna, uh, I've been, and the people that, uh, all his exes. <laughs> uh, so I've learned, uh, and I've met a lot of different people. Uh, so what I want to do is, if we can get everybody to stand up, and I, I'm, I'm asking a big thing, because I can barely do that right now with my knee, of course. So for those of you that know Tim Smith for five years or less, I have a seat. Oh, top. Sorry, I, I get I'm moving around a lot. Okay, about five to ten years. Have a seat. All right, ten to fifteen. How about ten to fifteen? Sound like I'm doing a countdown. All right. How about uh, fifteen to twenty? Twenty twenty five. Twenty five to thirty. Thirty thirty five. Wow. 40, 45, 50. Now you got to sit down sooner or later because I know you're not that old. How old are you? 52. Oh my gosh. All right. So look at the crowd. This is his family. But you know what? We've known him for a lot, a lot of years. So have a seat. Thank you so much. Not to, uh, it's amazing. So I'm really grateful you're all here, and I'm really grateful to the family and friends. I don't, family and friends that's, that's stuck around with uh, Tim Smith. Um, these last few months has been have been difficult for me, uh, and I'm sure difficult for a lot of people that have watched. Um, we slowly lose our friend Tim Smith. Um, but I want to thank the family and friends that were there for us uh, while we did the hospice, while we did the, uh, the chemo and the radiation, uh, the gifts that people brought, the friendships, the thank yous, the phone calls, the flowers, the food, the candy, the, the drive-bys, the, all the things, the prayers that people gave to us uh, and to the family is amazing. Uh, so, Kathy, I think we had just left Beth and Tom's and... <laughs> Tim wasn't looking good. He wasn't feeling well, uh, but he stuck it out, man. He, he was a trooper. He did all he could to still be a part of life. So Kathy was concerned because she was getting ready to have surgery, and Tim wasn't in the best shape. And she was talking about who's going to take care of her, and Tim turned to her and said, Kathy, I've got an army. Here is Tim Smith's army. So, thank you for being here. Um, I don't have enough digits. I don't have enough fingers, toes. I'm going to need everybody else's hands for, for those that, that are part of Tim's life. Uh, it's really uh, difficult to say goodbye to a, an old friend. Uh, you know, loss is, uh, is, a, is a new beginning, and we move on. Uh, we can always remember Tim Smith. We have... Uh, Tim in our heart. Um, you got, we, we talked about anonymity in Narcotics Anonymous. Uh, we put in, uh, an infinity chip on the back because Tim is, did die uh, clean and sober uh, 34 years. He was extremely proud of that. He was extremely proud of everybody that he ever touched or ever was a part of. Um, he always talked about his kids. Uh, he loved to talk with Shauna about organization. He, Tim, would organize to organize, just to organize again. 
the guy was organized. He had labels, he had this and that, and you're right. He had a tool for everything, and if he didn't have a tool, we went to Harbor Freight to get it. Oh, he would order on Amazon, or we would go to Home Depot. Scotty, he'd love to surf with you. Uh, he talked about the two of you most all the time we talked. Uh, he will be missed. Uh, I got to meet Kathy and her kids. Uh, we have, you know, Nick, uh, Michael, uh, the family of Pim Smith. I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, the family of Pim Smith here with all of us. So if you didn't know Tim very well, uh, he would call me and he probably called some of you all and say he'd have a new tool. Oh, I got a new tool. You got to come check it out. I'm like, okay, great. So now we've got five chainsaws. So we have a chainsaw that we've never even used, which is really sad. He was so excited about getting this chainsaw and he never got a chance to use it. So one day I had asked him, I go, can I borrow your full saw? I've known this guy 30 years. He goes, well, you know, it's new. And I look at him like, what do you mean? That, you know, it's new. I, of course it's new. I mean, what, is, what am I going to do with it? It's a full saw. You know, you know, I'm not going to break it or return it to you in a, in a bad way. I mean, it reminds me of the days when we were using, we had to explain to everybody about, okay, your brakes are really kind of squeaky. You got to turn the signal for, you know, all these ifs or what's or buts to ride your car, drive your car. You know, but he gives, you know what, that chainsaw is new. And I'm like, oh, okay. So he did it a second time. I asked him again. I go, uh, about a, two weeks later, I go, can I borrow the chainsaw? He goes, well, you know, it's new. And I'm like, I looked at him, I said, dude. What are we going to do, Blanken? I mean, we've known each other for so many years, but it was important to him. It was his chainsaw, you know, and so the tools that he had, he would share with anybody. He really did, but I think it was just really funny. He loved also, I think, and Kathy always said it, he loved to give me a hard time. He really liked to just poke me in and prod me and, you know, get me going, and, and I could get going. Okay, so here's one of my, my conspiracy theories. Have you ever tried to open a Kleenex box? And when you pull a Kleenex out, you get like three or four. Has anybody ever done that? Okay, how much money is being wasted? How much extra money do we to make by doing that? I think it'd be doing it on purpose. So the last time that I really spent with Tim was our UFC night for fights. And, uh, you know, I'm always talking about conspiracy, this and that. And Tim kind of like, you know, changes subjects. He didn't want to talk about it. And we talked about the weather. And we talked about like yesterday when Scotty goes, well, what about the Dodgers? You know, we, so he changed the subject. But my thing was, okay, so here we are. We're paying $80 to watch a USC fight. Tim and I split it. I pay 40, he pays 40. You know, and I'm thinking, you know, the people in the, in the UK and Europe are eating this for free. Why the hell, why the heck do we have to support this whole thing? What I've learned now is that the United States kind of supports everything. So uh, if you want to take and watch a USC fight in Europe, you can get it for free. Maybe you have to pay $20, but it's pretty cheap. Here, it's $80. That's my, my conspiracy, and I'm going to stick to it. So, Tim would just kind of listen to me, and we'd talk about surfing or the weather or his new tools or uh, part of the fun. And what he used to really enjoy was uh, he'd go to home uh, Harbor Freight and Home Depot with his brother, Steve. Uh, they would go. And so we started doing that. And he'd call me, let's go to Home Depot. I go, okay, what are we going to go get? And he goes, well, I don't know. We're just going to look. And I'm like, okay. So we just go to Home Depot and he'd get this and that. And, you know, I, I do, Tim, do you ever need that? And he goes, yeah, I've got like six more and I need another one. I'm like, okay. All right. But Tim, and I just realized my mom was kind of the same way. She had two stairs. I mean, she had two levels. So one day after she passed away, I'm sorry, I'm not in the mic, but, you know, she had like 60 pairs of scissors. Why do you need 60 pairs of scissors? Well, you got different scissors. You got scissors that cut paper. You got scissors that cut cloth. You got zigzag zippers, uh, scissors. I mean, you got all kinds of different. That's what Tim had. He, had. he had one for this and one for that. And one, you know, so he had a little bit of everything. So we would still go. So one of the last projects, he'd, all, he'd call Sam and we'd talk about projects. He called me and he goes, I need some help. I'm like, well, what do you know? He's like, I'm, we got to put this tarp up. I don't know about, there's something about tarps with Tim Smith. I don't know what it was. Tents and tarps. He had uh, just uh, a plethora of tarps. I don't know why. He had tarps for everything. So he had me come over, and I'm like peg leg trying to help him put this thing up. 
And so he pulled like three or four tarps together and we had rope and we had wire and we had, we had these S hooks and we had uh, alligator clips and we had like long, I don't even know what they're called. Uh, we had to go buy them because we didn't have them, but they're long metal things that with two screws at the end and you know, tie them together. I don't know what they're called, but uh, you guys, you mechanical guys, you know what they're. So we put this thing together and two days later, it fell down because the wind, the wind just blew it away. So we never put it back together, just two pieces, two, too many pieces. But what we had, so now Tim has a chicken shed called the coop. We've got the, the metal house with all his tools. We've got the white house, which is a big, huge tarp thing. And then he's got his garage. So he's got to have tools, the same amount of tools in each of the different locations. And that only makes sense, right? So he's got tools everywhere. Um, I will miss my friend, Tim Smith. Uh, he will always be in my heart. I am the man today because of Tim Smith and Narcotics Anonymous and the people that I met in the rooms. Uh, I can't say enough for, for my friendship with him. Uh, we have lost a great man, a friend, partner, uh, all around great guy. Uh, we learned a lot together. Uh, it was a uh, bit of a blessing to be a part of his life and to be able to be there uh, when he passed, to be a part of the hospice part in the situation. Uh, it was tough to watch. Anyone who's been around people that have cancer, it's tough to watch. The progression changes, the difficulty. You know, and I don't want to say I've done this, uh, that I've done it like four or five times now. It's tough to lose people and it's tough to watch them. Um, some of the toughest times I had with Tim, the most difficult times was, uh, you know, he already wanted to live to 90. Unfortunately, he didn't make to 90. Uh, one of the conversations was, you know, he goes, Trace, you know, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to be able to do it. You know, uh, he'd been given three to five years. Uh, we got about a year and a half, two years out of it. I'm thankful for that. We're very fortunate to have him. Um, oh, I forgot the other thing was that, that he taught me, pay yourself first. You know, that was one of the, um, the big things was that, you know, when you get paid, take a little bit and put it away. And when you get a raise, take a little bit and put it away. So by the time you have a uh, retirement age, you're a little older, you have a little bit of a chunk change. You know, you got some money saved away. So, so that's the thing uh, is to put the money away, pay yourself first. Um, I could go on and on. Uh, I'm sure we're all getting hungry when we're on here. But Kathy has to say, uh, and I don't know, what do we know about those? We don't know that? Huh? Not now. Okay, not now. All right, so just real quickly, uh, and I'll say that, that we have uh, the picture the family de decided on. Uh, we put in the serenity prayer because we all know the serenity prayer, most of us do. And then uh, we have Tim, uh, welcome to the Tim's Mintone Beach. Uh, there is actually a beach in Tim's yard, Mintone Beach. And then we have the, uh, the prayer from Scotty, he's gone, and then the ship. I'll say one last thing, um, is that early on in this planning stage, we, uh, the family or Kathy had decided to have this at her house. And we said, uh, we're not going to have enough, we're not going to have enough room. I just could imagine Bill, the street, with all this parking on that street, trying to get into that house. You know, we're thinking, okay, where's everyone going to the bathroom and then the, the yard and the dogs. And so anyway, here we are. We've got a fine, fine uh, venue. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for uh, being a part of Tim's site, Smith's life. Thank you. So when I was trying to decide what to wear today, I sent Kathy a text, is it, you know, formal, should I wear a suit? And she goes, eh, ah, Tim would want you to be casual. So I started thinking sleeveless shirt, shorts, combat boots. <laughs> <laughs> she was saying I even wore those darn boots to play pickleball. Yeah. All right. So moving back to family now, there's uh, no one Tim could have possibly been prouder of than his uh, son, Scotty. 
So uh, we're going to have Scotty come up and uh, just, you know. Scotty, Tim Stone, there's Scott, you run the machine. My wife, Carol, up there. Um, so many of you know my dad from family. Many of you are friends from way back. Many of you knew dad from the recovery community. And many of you from pickleball. And maybe, maybe some of us, all of the above. So thank you all for being here today. It's great to be here and share some stories to celebrate God's wonderful life of generosity, positivity, gratitude, and friendship. You can tell a lot about a person by their friends. And I would like to say that I felt such joy and wonderful warmth from so many of you, particularly during the last days of Dodge life from those of you that came by the house. It has been great to get to know many of you more deeply, and I've been very impressed with the amazing character I've seen in all of you. Thank you all for your support and the prayers from those who couldn't be there those last days. Well, there were challenges. We felt a wonderful sense of grace, and I think my dad was happy to hear in the background the joyful voices and the new friendships and the family bond strengthening. We were lucky to be able to get him home during those last days so he could be around loved ones, joy, and fresh air. If we didn't get him out of the hospital sooner, Sam was ready with the truck out the hospital door asking dad if he wanted to make a run for it. Dad was one of those special people that had a song in his heart, a smile on his face, and was always eager to extend a helping hand to those in need. He had a twinkle in his eye that conveyed his kind generosity, love to all, and an amazing ability to make the best of the moment. We would be missed, but there will be a loving part of him left behind in the hearts of all who knew him. Dad was always so generous, giving my girls the $2 bills and silver dollars, he loved to give silver dollars to kids and those he had just met simply for the joy of sharing a smile. My girls, Emma and Mia, loved his generosity and how he was always willing to get to their level as kids and just play. They loved the coin toss game, grandpa latching them up into the air, camping in the RV at the beach, submerged by the fire at night, and his ability to listen to whatever was going on in their young minds, being generously respectful to them. He gave them such wonderful gifts from the kids' red VW van to the ukuleles to the hula book. He was always on the lookout for something they would enjoy. My wife, Kelly, was also very impressed that dad made a concerted effort to get to know her before we got married and that he has always been willing to help us out. We were very happy that he did get a chance to get to know her side of the family in Hawaii too. And like, it's been said earlier, dad loved tools. He loved motorcycles and his RV. And one little story, we could always hear grandpa coming up from several blocks away because like he said, loud pipes save lives. Though when he would come to help with the babies, he learned to coast in so as not to wake them. You know, there are certain people that when you talk to them, you leave with more energy than you started with. Dad was one of those people and I'm lucky to have had him. to have had him as my father. He loved being the grandpa and spending time and talking with family and friends. He loved his brothers, Danny and Steve, dearly, and spoke of them often. He enjoyed grabbing a cup of coffee with Uncle Steve and golfing and surfing with Uncle Danny. The three of them moved around quite a bit as kids, and it seemed like every time I talked to Dad, I learned of a new place they lived as kids. I think he said 28 moves before age 10. Despite all the moves, dad seemed to find his way through those close bonds, a strong spirit, and a positive mindset. That strong spirit helped him as he was dealing with cancer. 
he and Kathy still found a way this last summer to come out to see us for a week of pickleball, tennis, surfing, hiking, and family get-togethers. He actually wore us out that week as we tried to keep up with him. It was also very important to dad to keep in touch with his nephews and stepkids and be able to spend time together and enjoy the moment. He has been the glue that has helped keep family and friends close. I sometimes wonder how he found the time to be there for so many people, but I think it was really that kind generosity and love he had. I think he lived on love and of course also taco tia burritos. I had some challenges early in life, like many growing up in the psychedelic 60s. What started as a way to stay awake for work, substance abuse then became his greatest obstacle. But with the help from my mom, my sister, and from that point, his sponsor, and many, many others, he took many steps forward. and turn that obstacle and challenge into a way to help others. From there, he just ran with it, being ever grateful to those that helped him along the way. He saw every day as a blessing and sometimes would say after a camping trip that he would think of pinching himself to make sure it was real because life felt so wonderful. I think this shows that if someone is willing to take the steps necessary to help others just for the pure sake of wanting to help, it just so happens that the reward is even greater. Camping was one of God's favorite things, and, I, and it was a good balance to his always-on-the-go mentality. Besides camping, I was lucky to have other memorable moments of stillness with him as well. One day, sitting in the backyard for a few minutes, we were just silently feeling the breeze and watching the trees sway and enjoying the rhythm of nature. After a few minutes, he said, oh, that was cool. And then he was back to his on-the-go mode, cutting, hammering, painting, or sawing something. <laughs> that was someone who amazingly just kept on improving in life, taking up kickboxing, regular gym workouts, and busting out 15 pull-ups in his late 60s. Proving his surfing, his diet, his relationships, projects in the yard and projects with others, he just kept charging forward in life and setting the bar high for us to follow. He was a simple and humble guy, but one thing he would boast about from his early days, like Nick mentioned, working at the Honda shop was riding off 10-digit plus part Honda numbers. He loved numbers, loved spreadsheets more than anyone I knew. He was always so excited when he figured out something new with a spreadsheet and he even had spreadsheets for his tools. Dad and the rest of his surf crew all enjoyed their fun time surfing and being at the beach. Dad and I also had many great time surfing and just hanging out in the water. One day at San Alejo, we got lucky and the waves were great and only a few of us were out. He took off on a beautiful wave, flying down the wave across the clean, glassy section. It must have been over a minute of pure bliss, and I could feel his joy and excitement. A perfect wave, all for him. The guy next to me asked, is that your dad? Yeah, I said, how old is he? 71, I said. It was just a few years ago. We both just sat in amazement as dad paddled back out for more obviously charged up from one of the best rides of his life. It was a great moment for all of us there. He taught me important lessons through his examples, such as gratitude and seeing the best in everyone. He also taught me tips like how smart it is to always have a pocket knife handy. And even more important, how important it is to be there for a friend and keep in touch and focus on the positive. It was my sincere hope that his wonderful values of gratitude true friendship, making the best of the moment, and his exceptionally bright positivity live on through all of us, through our memories of him, and in so doing, make our light shine that much brighter. That soul is at peace from a life that involved reflection and continued forward progress towards noble goals. 
I know he has a piece up there knowing there was so much love for him and he has finished his work for this life. He will be a source of inspiration and guidance that continues forward in my life. God left a lasting, joyful, steadfast, and heartfelt loving impression on me and my loved ones. I am grateful for our time together. I will keep the lessons and wonderful memories. Now, I'd like to say a short prayer, if I may. God, we give you thanks, praise, glory, love, and respect, and with gratitude, I ask that you guide and protect God's soul on his journey and forever keep him close to your love, joy, peace, and light. May God keep us all close to his love, joy, peace, and light and give us guidance and comfort. Amen. We love you, Dad. Thank you. Uh, okay, so now we're going to go a little bit over. I hope no one minds. Anybody hungry? Anyway, number six. So finally, Kathy. Oh. You're Kathy. Where can I possibly express what you have been through in this last of your life? And, uh, you have come to let me shine. You always want Hi, everyone. On behalf of Tim, my parents, and myself, I'd like to thank you all for being here to celebrate an amazing man for having such a common name. Tim Smith was an extraordinary I'm sure that I'm Tim Smith had a bigger personality than him. That's amazing. I'm happy. I haven't been able to introduce yourself to me. I would love to meet anyone who is here for Tim. Tim and I went through our jobs. I was a privilege to ask for a good clerk. I gave her three of my sisters. We were always friendly. I got retired. I would go back to Tim and drug court graduations, which had become my passion, as I love seeing people reclaim their lives. Sometimes I would run into Tim at this graduation from a little chat. We would come in here and from the room to this room. Something like this. Hi, this is Tim Smith. Kind of a strange phone call, but I was wondering if you would like to have coffee or have dinner sometime and get to know each other better. Wow, okay, that's all. That was your idea. Do call me back, please. Yes. <laughs> So sweet, and we were over longer by that. I sound a hard to turn around. It was too long. That voice, oh my God, was changed forever. It took us a while to count, however, because I'm sort of a last minute type of guy. I would call and want to do something that evening. Mm -hmm. It was a girl, and we had a calendar. It was something I had heard of. It took a while, but it got the hang of it. And he gradually became a part of my all important calendar. He introduced me to his world of motorcycles, camping at the beach, his family, and his wonderful recovery community. Many of whom I have become close friends with. It truly was a different world for me, and I enjoy all of it. I introduced him to my ultimate kickboxing and fitness family, and we soon became a lot of number. Himself and the exercise and the things we meet there. He was always so funny with everybody, especially the new people that came in. He would show them the different rooms and help them with their equipment. 
realized it was just like a meeting when we treat the newcomer as the most important person. That is what Tim would do for the movie that Jenny was heartwarming to watch. I also showed him my night of traveling, which included trips throughout the country where I met most of my cousins and family. He would always say for a new child he never saw a girl with so many cousins. He's clearly right, I do have a lot of cousins. We were different road trips where we would fly back east for some family event. To car and make a vacation out of it. Through those trips we were all over the East Coast and part of the Midwest. We flew to Canada and we were on the trail, working on the South City, Sturgis, Mount Rushmore, just to name a few. I always meant so much to me to see my family. We were on these trips, we would return to visit my grandparents' graves in Virginia after 43 years after they passed away. My grandmother's headstone was very polished, so Tim gave the people there some way to get it cleaned up, which I thought was so nice. The language traveling in the RV was so cloudy, and I was over the western part of the United States riding motorcycles in the national parks and just camping everywhere. It was great. This is from the world who never liked to get dirty, but <laughs> it was one of the places that Tim was the happiest. At the ocean, in the campfire with his family and friends. We visited every colony in Arizona, as well as our Arizona cousins in the Talked to him a couple of times. He took the man from his 65th birthday, but I'm not telling you how long ago that was. Skydiving a few years ago, he was really doing for anything. We were fortunate enough to go to Fiji in 2022, but that sounds very amazing. Then we would zip the camp exploring and visit the local villages. And Tim really loved it because when we went to the village, the oldest, he was usually the oldest man in the group, so they made him the chief, which meant that we had to walk behind him and obey him. So I quickly said to him, you better enjoy the heck out of this because it's coming to a screeching halt as soon as we leave the village. <laughs> One of the things I remember from that trip is that Tim bought a small surfboard from a local vendor. We noticed that the men had very few tools and the ones he had were not good. We came home from the Harbor Freight, bought this man some tools, and sent him along with some of his own tools, all these to this man in Fiji. We knew how he doesn't need to get rid of his tools. This is really a typical act of kindness by Tim Smith. Now, many of us, that knew or have loved or lived better than Jim Smith, and looked at his super slow hearing. He had the ability to hear a dog barking right away or a hush sound, especially at night time. And I remember the beginning thinking, okay, I'm going to do my best to be quiet, but after a while I realized I needed to set boundaries for myself. For instance, he'd be asleep and I'd watch a show on the iPad with my earphones. Even then, he would ask me to turn the sound down. I kind of roll my eyes, but I do it. This went on a couple times, it was like breathing or any kind of movement. One night it was raining. I turned the page of my book, noisily, I guess, and he asked me what I was doing over there. I said, You know what, Tim? I can start having my best life and turn the page of my book. What are you doing? It was always so funny when I read it to you because Tim was really one of the noisiest people I ever knew. He talked loud, he sneezed loud, and he was just generally a loud person. But to make matters even funnier, he, me, had the noisiest dogs in the neighborhood. When Tim and I first met, my daughter said to me, You have met your match socially. He talks as much as you do in the morning. Well, this soon come out into an issue because we both wanted to be heard. And to let someone get their thoughts out and not interrupt is challenging. He would always say to me, will you let me finish my sentence? And I would say, I've been waiting a long time for a break to dialogue and it never comes. It's kind of every man for himself in this house. Not to change, it's just something we were working on at the very end about Tim, we all know he's a very social and talkative guy. 
and one of the places he loved to socialize and talk was on the pickleball court. He had so many friends there and found a new audience for all his stories. So I found it extremely funny in the way he told me that I shouldn't talk so much when I'm playing pickleball and you need to concentrate on the game. Another irony. I'm not sure what my response was, but I don't think that I quit talking. Both loved playing pickleball, but quickly found that we didn't play that well together. He would always coach me and tell me what I was doing wrong. I guess I just wasn't that receptive to it. However, he pointed out that I was very receptive if somebody else wanted to tell me how to play better, and he was right. One of Tim's great passions in life was helping people out of the darkness of addiction. He used to always say that helping me out as well as without parallel. He said that he would feel like Hannah was on his way up and was able to help someone. He was a strong recovery and celebrated 34 years clean on October 27, 2023. He now has his chip. I only got one. Tim was the happiest when surfing with Scott in the ocean or spending time with Sean. He needed nothing more than to be a good dad and a grandpa. He was so grateful to have been given a second chance to do this. We were in our 60s when we got together, and both of us had been married previously and had our own families. I liked to call us together a modern family. He became a father figure to my children, not many. He was always concerned for their well being and for my nephew Jacob. I came to really love Stacy. Her boys, Nick and Michael, Jen and Kirsten, Lee and Michael, Violet, Matthew, and Dean. I really appreciate being included in your family celebrations and hope that we can keep that connection. We still have a camping trip we had to reschedule, so we really can make that happen. Sadly, I never got a chance to meet Tim's brothers, Danny and Steve. All the words that Tim would tear up at the news of them. I'm so thankful for the relationship I had with both of them. Those kids, Danny, John, and Michael, along with their lovely wives, Allie, Amanda, and Bob, and their mother, Judy, have always been so welcome to me. Getting to be a little part of their children's lives, now in the morning, Evelyn and Kinsley, has meant a lot to us. We loved going to the middle and the intercycles and activities and enjoyed babysitting Evelyn and Kinsley whenever they needed us. Tim has always stayed in regular contact with Steve's wife, Nancy, and I think she came to look forward to his phone calls. He was always there for her and for his nephew, Christopher. By the way, Christopher is the one who's put together the slideshow that you will be seeing shortly. Um, thank you for always bringing me children that made me feel welcome. And they're part of my family. Scotty, she's similar. Sean Klein, part of Joe says, and they're similar as well. I've always cared a lot for them. But after Tim got sick, it seems our relationship went to a different level. Everyone came together in a new way to care for our wonderful Tim, which we cooking for him, researching project products that would benefit him, taking him to the ER, picking up meds, and just generally being there for him when he needed support. Everything was there every single time. I saw one of my sick and my enemies in my life shortly. And Diana, Lindsay, and Tracy in the yoga classes. In August of last year, we went to Hawaii to visit Scotty Kelly, me and Oma. It was the first time we had gotten in the new year because most of the year was devoted to Tim's health issues. It's wonderful because Tim felt good the whole entire time we were there. Like Scotty said, he wore us out. He had really wonderful and quality time with Scotty, Kelly, and the girls. He and Scotty were able to take their surfboards out into the ocean together, which ended up being the last time they would do them. We were able to get in two camping trips last year. 
First in June, we went camping with our friends, Lance and Jude. We were not really campers, but we needed to spend time with Tim because of his recent diagnosis. We went to the Navi, secure camping reservations at San Clemente, and we spent a wonderful few days down there together with him. Tragically, when he's passed away, I was favorably in the family. So those moments are especially precious to us, and we really miss this. Our last camping trip was in October, Camp Pelican, with our good friends climbing up. We had such a great time relaxing and taking the time together with our friends. It was sad, but it ended because I had a feeling it would be our last camping trip, and it was. In September, we went on a small pickleball cruise with our friends. Tim was able to really enjoy himself. We played pickleball in Catalonia, and Tim had such a great time. He was happy, socializing, being on top of his game. It's just a really good moment. I'm so glad I took some neat pictures and video. On November 16th, I had hip replacement surgery. In the weeks leading up to the surgery, I was debating when I wanted to have the surgery because because of Tim's health. We talked about it many times, but he insisted that I go ahead with it. He said, as much as you've taken care of me in the last few years, I really need to be there for you. So I didn't have a bit. I think he just willed himself to be better. He stayed at the hospital with me the whole entire day, and it was a long day. He and my daughter took care of me that first week and a half, and that's what I needed. He passed away three weeks later. I didn't want to talk too much about when Tim was sick, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the outpouring of support and love we received from the time he first became ill about two and a half years ago to the end, and how much it was appreciated. We constantly heard from family and friends throughout this very difficult journey, wishing him well, sending love. When we brought him home in hospice, he had a very demonic core group came from him. Sam and Claudia came from Idaho to be here with him and stayed at the house of West. Sean, Scotty, and Tracy were there every single day. It's our honor to care for him. We haven't been told that he was the happiest. And I realized that he was probably going to pass away on my birthday. I went back to the metro and put me here with my hips and he said, I'm not sure if he heard me, but he did pass away on my birthday. He finally was at peace and released from pain. I will celebrate his life every year from now on when my birthday comes around. Every time I try to do something for what they've done for us, the answer is it's what we do. That is the caliber of people I have in my life. We had a decade together, and I feel so lucky we had that time. I have to find one that I'm doing well, but it's very sad for me to be here without Tim. I have a very strong support group between my wonderful children and nephew, my wonderful cousins, and my wonderful friends. Wendy has been staying with me since Timmy passed away, and she, but she works from home, and it's been so comforting. I always commented on what a great group of people I have in my life. I'm not going to mention anyone individually because I will inevitably leave somebody out. You all know who you are. Your support in life has sustained me during this very sad time. I love Sean and Scotty and cherish the time I spent with them. He loved his other kids, grandkids, nephews, and nieces in all of you. He cultivated and worked relationships, which is a testament to the number of people that are here today. He loved me and my dogs hiding in the home in the ocean, hiding away in his backyard. That was all I needed. He was reminded me he was a very simple guy. In that simplicity, we bonded on what really matters in life. In the present, we have family and friends. He wasn't perfect, as many of us are, but tried to always do the right thing. I love you forever, too, so and thank you all again for being here today.
There we go. Do we have the slideshow queued up? Go ahead and put that on. Okay. Right. Uh, right. Set. Right. Set. 